So I've been considering uh, the story in the earlier part of the chapter, which is talking about healing the sick of the palsy. So I thought I would go through that scripture, similar to how I went through the disciples on the sea last week, and just uh, give you some thoughts that maybe you haven't thought about um, with this common this, with this very familiar story, right? So a lot of the stories in the gospel are very familiar to us. Uh, if you, it's not familiar to you, then you're not reading your Bible enough, all right? So these, these stories about Jesus should be very familiar. Um, even if you don't know all the specifics like we're talking about today, you should at least have this idea, like, you know, there was one day there was this particular palsy that was lowered through the roof and, and Jesus healed him. And it was quite a miraculous event and quite, quite um, something actually early on in the ministry as well. So... We will be going through this story, the healing, the sick of the palsy. And uh, it starts at the very beginning of the chapter in Mark 2. It's actually mentioned in Mark 2, in Luke 5, and in Matthew 8, I believe, as well. Um, so it's mentioned a few times in the Gospels. And like we looked at last week, we can look at this story at different angles and get a lot of insight into what is going on here and, and hopefully learn some lessons from this passage. So Mark 2, it starts off, and again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Now, of the three Gospels that mention this story, this is the only time I saw that this, this was mentioned, that it shows us that the reason why this sick of the palsy and his friends even knew that Jesus was at that house at that time is because it was noised abroad. And what that makes me think is, it makes me think of how we get the gospel out. Sometimes people hear about the gospel, they hear about something going on in the local area or things like that because the word gets out, right? So you kind of think, well, would this man have had this opportunity at this certain point in time? This doesn't dissolve him of his responsibility to believe on Jesus Christ. But the thing is, here's another opportunity for that man to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And the friends and the sick of the palsy were able to have this encounter. Why? Because it was noised abroad that Jesus was here to have that opportunity. And it makes me think of when we go out and preach the gospel, right? And in Romans 10, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's how we say we respond in faith by calling upon the name of the Lord. And that's how we receive salvation. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? See, so when you go out and preach the gospel, you take that opportunity to noise abroad the Lord Jesus Christ. That gives people another opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to prompt them to say, hey, you know, I'm a sinner. I need saving, just like them. They knew somebody in trouble to take them to Jesus. And in that case, it was actually a physically physical healing as well, as well as the spiritual. We see there because he says, hey, your sins are forgiven you as well. So verse 2, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Now when you look at this parable in Luke, oh, not this parable, the story in Luke 5, Notice who's all gathered in here as well, right? So this all oh, the house is full and all that sort of stuff. But it says here in Luke 5, 17, And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I don't know if you ever caught that when you read this story. It's saying that they were there. Because remember... Who was there? It was not only believers there, but there were also doubters there, right? There were also critics because they, when they hear him, they say like, this guy's making himself God. Obviously, if you're a believer, you know that that was God in the flesh. He was the son of God. So there were some non-believers there too. But look, interesting what it says there, right? They're there. The house is crowded. Not, it says all the way up to the door it's crowded. It's even crowded more than what we have here today, right? But... You see, it's crowded all the way up to the door. And the Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So even though they were so close to the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But why didn't it heal them? Because of faith, right? Because if it's not mixed with faith, you need to receive the grace of God by faith. So there's a picture here that oftentimes people are very close to Jesus Christ physically they're in church they, they think about all the people that have heard about the gospel before 
Right? You go out. Do you know about Jesus? Yeah, they know about Jesus. Well, what do I have to do to get to heaven? Oh, it's because I'm a good person. Right? They don't have the, the faith on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to save them, even though salvation is right there. It's present there to heal them. And that's a sad thing. A sad thing in a church as well. You know, I hope everybody here is saved. You know, and you're not just you're, you know, repeating the right words, but in your heart, you don't actually have faith on Jesus Christ. You know, so I, am a, I assume, I'm, I know most of you here, I assume most of you are saved, but man, it's always a good reminder to, to think, hey, just because you're in church, just because your family was Christian, just because you know all about the Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're trusting on Jesus Christ. You need to make sure you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not just close to Jesus like they are here. Because even when you're close to Jesus here, even in a, the physical sense here, you're just nearby, but without faith, the power to heal them would not actually heal them. So we need to make sure we do actually put our faith on Jesus Christ. And you know that. I'm not, I'm not making some nebulous claim that you... I don't want you to be in a state where you're just like, ah, oh, but you know, people say, oh, how do I know that I believe? You know, it's because I'm doing the works. It's because of all these things. And, and my sermon today is not about assurance of salvation. But to make things simple, you know if you believe. I mean, you know what you believe. You know what you're thinking now. Yeah, you, you, you might be thinking about something else other than the sermon. So let's uh, refocus back on the sermon. So that's all it is. Your, your, your faith is what you believe, and what you believe are the words you say to yourself in your head. You know, like when you say, what do I believe? Well, you, whatever you're saying to your head right now, if you say in your head, in your heart, I do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then that's the evidence. That's how you know you believe. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. You can have 100% assurance. But make sure, you, what I'm talking about is make sure you believe the right thing. Not like in 1 Corinthians 15. What did they do? They believed in vain. Why did they believe in vain? Because they believed in a Jesus Christ that didn't rise from the dead. Right? It's not that they believed and like, you know, it's like they lost their salvation and all that sort of. They believed in vain because they were denying the resurrection from the dead. And that's why Paul says, if you don't even believe Jesus resurrected from the dead, how is he going to resurrect you from the dead? You know, why would you rise again from the dead when Jesus did not rise again from the dead? So we need to make sure we don't believe in vain. We need to make sure we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not believe in vain, maybe like the Catholics and the Orthodox do, where they know about Jesus, but they're not believing on him for their salvation. So they're believing things about him, but not trusting for salvation. So he was present to heal them. Look at Hebrews 4. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Look at it. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Right? So that's what I think about when I think of that, this story here in Luke 5. And it's like these people not saved so close, sitting right next to Jesus. Because chances are, these Pharisees and doctors of the law, you know, what liking the uppermost rooms at feasts, probably took the seats closest to the, to the guest speaker they had in that house, right? And the, and the rest of the people were struggling to get in, like the sick of the palsy, there's nowhere to get in, right? To come through the, through the roof. So they would have been right there, you know, maybe Jesus giving them COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But so close, you know, they can hear, feel the breath of Jesus, you know? But... That doesn't mean they're saved, you know, even though it's so close. The power of the Lord was present to heal them, and it needs to be mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let's continue in verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, there's a few things in this passage here I've underlined. I just want to go through really quick. One is, you notice here that you're given the number of people that are carrying the sick of the palsy. Now, it makes sense for, because it's kind of like one on each corner, kind of like how they carry the Ark of the Covenant. But what it makes me think of here. Because obviously, to carry somebody, they're quite heavy, and obviously to carry them onto the roof and let them down, you need a few people. But the spiritual lesson I think we can take from this is, think about how many people it took to bring this sick man to the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it took more than one person. Right, so you may say, oh yeah, well physically they had to carry him there and all sorts of, and in this scenario, 
He's actually getting physical healing as well. But there's always a spiritual application, right? The spiritual application of all these healings in the Bible is that people are coming to Jesus in order to be saved, right? So they're coming physically to him to get healed. But the spiritual lesson is that we come to Jesus Christ in faith to be removed of our, sin, our iniquities spiritually, right? To be saved. So what, what, may, what it makes me think here, and I don't know if you guys have had this thought, is we're told here that it took four people to bring this sick man, and in our analogy, he's an unsaved person, to Jesus Christ. And sometimes, that's why you have to realize, everybody has to be involved in soul winning. Because it, one person may not be enough to convince somebody to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if two people, three people, four people talk to that same person. I mean, think about your own testimony in your, old, in your own life. Was it just one person that had an effect on your salvation? Yeah, maybe one person had, a, had the, the primary effect, but then maybe you researched something, maybe another point in your life you ran across somebody that mentioned something and then that made you think and then in your workplace there was a Christian and, and they're, you know, maybe they're just their testimony and like the way they worked had an effect on you and, and that, all that sort of stuff. So you see how multiple things come to a head that give people the best opportunity and more opportunities to believe on Jesus Christ. And I think here, that's the picture we have here as well, that four people brought this person to Jesus Christ. So whether it's physically, in this instance, or spiritually, when our people, soul winners are out there preaching the gospel, that's why we all need to be in the game, right? We all need to be out there preaching the gospel, sharing, doing our best to spread the word so that Jesus will be noised abroad, right? And it'll bring people in to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes it takes multiple people right but not only spiritually when i think of this scenario in terms of preaching the gospel and getting people saved but i also think of physical health as well now yeah we don't have the laying on of hands and all that sort of stuff that the pentecostals still believe in but we can pray for one another right and god can still heal people but then sometimes you think maybe not as many people are getting healed because not as many people are praying for each other. So maybe if only one person's praying for them, and this is just obviously my opinions right now, maybe if one person's just praying for them, their chance of healing or the, you know, of, of, of God answering that prayer is not as much as if four people are praying for them. Because notice here when we go down into verse 5, when they bring the sick of the palsy to Jesus, look at what Jesus says. and Look at what the Bible says. When Jesus saw their faith. So who did he heal and who did he forgive the sins of? The sick of the palsy. But yet what did he consider when dealing with that sick of the palsy? When he saw their faith. So the sick of the palsy and the faith of the four friends. You know, what effect they have, I don't know. I guess only God will know how he takes into account all the different factors. But the fact of the matter is, God tells us here that Jesus saw the faith of all five of them and then acted on that. So think about that when you're giving the gospel. Think about that when you're praying for people that, you know, you, you may be one of a necessary piece of that puzzle that makes God move, you know, on that issue because he sees, hey, there's, he sees the faith. But like I said, you know, I don't, want you to, I don't want to get the impression that God is unmerciful just because there's not enough people praying or whatever. God does what's right. God always does what's right, but we can see here that it can make a difference, right? If more people get involved, more people are praying for each other, the faith of others makes a difference. And in fact, Paul even mentions that, that he has confidence that God will work in the Philippians because he's praying for them. So prayer definitely makes a difference. It's not the only thing that we're called to do, obviously, and we pray for things that are outside of our control, but it is a definite uh, factor in terms of things that happen. It actually changes reality. Now in verse 4, notice here, it says, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now the reason why I've chosen Mark 2 to go through, um, because there's a few things in Mark 2 that aren't mentioned in Luke and Matthew, because Matthew is actually the shortest account of this story. Luke, it just says they climb onto the roof and they lower him down. And if you read, read it in Luke, you may just get the impression that it's just like an open roof. But here in Mark 2, you realize that the roof is not an open roof, right? 
So I just want you to picture here, just like, just imagine, I mean, here we don't have the, you know, the tiling exposed and everything like that, but this is quite a scene that's going on where Jesus is preaching and you probably start to feel some dust, you know, dust is going on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, sitting close to Jesus. It uncovers, the sunlight comes in and then this guy on a bed just gets lowered down, <laughs> like right where Jesus is. But it just goes to show the commitment of these, this guy's friends. And that's what I was thinking about, right? You know, I appreciate you guys here. and I've got some great friends here. You know, that's what sort of made me think about this, uh, this, this sermon even to begin with, this story. Just thought the commitment of these guys, these, these, this, this man's friends to bring him to the Lord Jesus for this physical healing. And I mean, that's real friendship, right? Like the Bible says, a friend loveth at all times. You know, um, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. These sorts of things, you know, real friends love at all times. Real friends don't bail on each other. Real friends can have a conversation with each other without getting upset with each other, right? And that's what we want to get to. Just because we know each other here, that doesn't always mean that we're good friends, you know, but you want, you want good friends in this church. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to have to interact and you're going to have to talk to one another. You're going to have to love one another. It requires love to make friends. You know, and that's why the people that you have in your life that are your friends are the ones you've loved the most because you've gone through thick and thin and you've upset each other and you probably ah, and hang on the phone and then you're like, ah, I'm sorry, man. Like, and then you make up. You know, that's how marriage has to work as well. So this picture here is, it's just so, they're so committed. <laughs> they're so dedicated to help their friend. And I just thought, man, these four guys, or four, I don't, you know, I guess they're four men, helping this, their friend, the sick of the palsy, to get to Jesus. I mean, that's the sort of zeal and passion we ought to have. You know, they, they, I think a lot of uh, these people would probably put a lot of us to shame when we think about how we treat our friends, we treat our loved ones. I know uh, I definitely feel that as well. And notice, see, they had to uncover the roof. So it takes work. You know, if you think like you're just, uh, you know, preaching the gospel bringing people to Jesus, the work of God, like loving people, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, and if you would just realize that, then you won't go get so discouraged about trying to love people, right? It's, it's, it's hard work. It requires work in order to love people. And just like here, it required hard work for them to uncover that roof. And I mean, just think about getting him onto the roof. I don't even know, how did they even get him onto the roof? I, I, I know I've seen photos of Houses in ancient Israel, maybe they just got the stairs, the stone stairs going up to the roof. But what if that house didn't have that? How did they get him onto the roof? They must have like two people climbed up or whatever, and then they're like, pass it to me, get him up, you know. Get onto the roof, first of all. Then when they're on the roof, you know, <laughs> when, they're, yeah, when they're on the roof, then they have to uncover the tiles, right? And then, and then let him down. So you see how it t requires a lot of work. And what I'm, what I'm trying to paint the picture here is, when you want to love people, it requires work. You know what I mean? So you can't just sort of slack and think that you can be loving people the way Jesus calls us to love people. Now, the last thing here in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, when the sick of the palsy came to Jesus in this instance, isn't it interesting that, that the friends and the sick of the palsy were so desperate, they were probably thinking about the physical healing. Right? The physical healing, like, we come, we want him to, be, to rise up again from his bed and, and to be healed. But what, did, what was the first thing Jesus did when the sick of the palsy came to him? Forgiveness of sins. Salvation. Right? Second here is he healed him of his sickness. And in, in fact, he did that to show that he was the Son of God, as we see later on. So what's the lesson? What's the takeaway here? Well, the takeaway here is what's more important to people. Right? Because oftentimes when people come to Jesus, they think about the physical first. They think about their ailments. They want something from Jesus first. And then they say, well, if he does this for me, then I'll believe on him. All those sorts of things. You know, they put salvation second. But Jesus has his priorities right. He knows what's more important. What's more important? The salvation of that person's soul. So even though he knows 
what they've just worked hard to come. I mean, you think Jesus didn't know that they were outside starting to come on the roof? And he expected it, obviously, when, it, when, they, when, they descend, when that man descended in front of him. But what did he address first? The salvation. So we'll turn to Mark 8 here, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So you see how it's so much more important that a person is saved than just if they receive something physical, even physical healing. And when you compare this with Matthew 9, so sorry, I got it wrong. It wasn't Matthew 8, Matthew 9. Matthew 9. This is the one verse I want to show you in the account in Matthew 9. Look, it says, Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, I just thought it was interesting that the other passages didn't mention this, because if you see in Mark 2, it just says, He saith unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But in Matthew 9, Jesus says, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And you know what that made me think? Do you think sometimes people, you want, you want something from Jesus, right? Well, it could be something financial, something health-wise, whatever, some issue that you're having in your life, and it doesn't get resolved. What immediately happens normally? Discouragement. You lose your joy. You are not of good cheer. But here... It's like a reminder that, hey, you came to get physical healing, but you have salvation, and that should be enough to make you happy. Amen. That should be enough for you to be content. That should be enough of a reminder that, hey, even though you don't get the things that you may want in this life, whether it's physical ailments, whether it's financial, whether it's whatever, it is, relationships and whatnot, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will always have salvation. And that's something to be happy about. That's something to be joyous about. And no matter what happens in this life, we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have salvation. We can never lose our salvation. Once saved, always saved. You know, we know we have eternal life because we believe on the name of the Son of God. So I think that's a good reminder here that he's saying to him, look, because at this point in time, does the sick of the palsy know he's going to get healed? He probably came and it's like, oh, I sick of the palsy. You know, I'm going to get healed. And Jesus said, hey, be of good cheer. Thy sins be Forgiven thee. Romans 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I think that's the perspective we should always take. Hey, death is tragic. Health challenges are unfortunate. You know, financial issues are in inevitable. But when you compare them to salvation and you compare them to what's going to happen in the next life, the Bible says here it's not even worthy to be compared. The fact that you even make the comparison, it's not even worthy of that. right? Because what's going to happen in the life to come? And I think that's, that's a very good perspective to have. Suffering is something a lot of people struggle with. Not only actually struggle in their life, I mean doctrinally struggle with to, in order to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how many people have you run into... Why don't they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, because if there's a loving God, why did he allow X, Y, Z? Right? And they just have the wrong impression of God that God doesn't allow suffering. God allows suffering. Suffering molds us. Suffering improves us. Suffering makes believers more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why suffering exists. And you need to understand that. Don't get discouraged by it because we are given on the behalf of Christ to suffer. Right? And also, it's not even worthy to compare this life, this vapor of a life which appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away with the glory that shall be revealed in us, those of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's continue. Mark 2, it says here, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? So what I just wanted to point out here is what Jesus is doing here to the Jews that were there, and the scribes and uh, the Pharisees, and, the, and I think the Sadducees were there too. The, the, oh, sorry, the scribes and, and the Pharisees, was a clear indication that he was claiming to be God. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, yeah, maybe Jesus didn't say those exact words, I am God, worship me. 
But he did say he did say to Doubting Thomas when Doubting Thomas said, Lord, my Lord and my God, and he said, Hey, if you believe you've seen me, you believe. Right? He did forgive people of their sins. Right? And the and the and the Jews recognized that this act of saying your sins are forgiven you, not that God will forgive your sins, I am forgiving your sins, is an act of a divine person, yep. right? Of a divine being. That's why they said they the way they react. Right? Is why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? They recognized the truth that only God could forgive sins. So the fact that Jesus is doing this, he's claiming to be God, right? By forgiving somebody's sins. It's the same in John 10. This is why people try to make Jesus mean different things than, than he does. But why did the Jews have a different understanding of what he was saying, right? We say, oh, you know, he says, I and my Father are one. Oh, that doesn't mean Jesus is saying he's God or he is God the Father. That's just saying, oh, they have the same purpose. They're just two, two different beings, but they just have one a combined purpose. Like we have a combined purpose with God. But what, how did the Jews understand it though? It says here, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So you notice there that Jesus is plainly making it clear that he is God. And when he forgave the sick of the palsy of his sins, he was making a statement that he was God. Right? And that's how they recognized that as well. Let's go on. Verse 8 in Mark 2. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. So we note here that in here, that that arise and take up thy bed and go into thy house, he, he actually directs it at the sick of the palsy. The, the, the scriptures actually mention it there. But what, what's the question he's asking the doubters here, right? He's saying, you know, if, if, if God has the power to do something, what's, what's easier? Is it easier to forgive sins or is it easier to... Um, make him rise up and, and, and rise again from dead. And you might think about this differently because some people might be thinking, well, oh, it's probably easier just to say your sins are forgiven you to actually heal somebody physically and, and make them uh, rise up. Some people might be thinking the other way, like, yeah, well, God has given such power unto men to heal people physically, but, but uh, forgiving them of their sins is actually the impossible task because only God can do it. So Jesus actually does both. But what I want you to think about, I, do you ever think, of, which one is easier? You know, like he said, well, he sort of gives the question, well, which one's easier? And then does both of them. So it's like, well, I don't know which one's easier now because he did both. But which one, which one is easier? I mean, my opinion, this is just my thoughts, just to get you guys thinking. I think it's easier to heal the sick of the palsy. Because God can heal the sick of the palsy, but in order for him to be able to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, what did he have to do? He had to step into the creation. He had to live sinless life for 33 years. He had to suffer, die on the cross, descend into hell for three days and three nights, pay eternity of hell for all of us, all of mankind, rise again from the dead victoriously, ascend into heaven one day to come again. I think that's a bit more of a task than healing the sick of the palsy when you put it into perspective. So even though here you read, oh, well, saying a few words is a lot easier than physically healing somebody. But the reason why Jesus can say those words is because he went through all that for us, you know. So I thought there. Um, but notice here how he says to him, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And he says, but that you, that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. And that is why miracles occur in the Bible. It's often there to confirm the word. Because right now, see, we're reading the word of God now after it's been penned down. Right? But there, obviously, these events are happening 
they're not they're not watching this happen like like we are and reading along in Mark 2 while these things are happening. It's like, Jesus, you missed a line there. So these things are obviously not written down while these are happening. So that's why miracles happened at that early church time, because it was to confirm the word. And we learn that from Mark 16. It says here, Mark 16, 20, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now I'll go here to Luke 5, because uh, here's a, um, uh, uh, another point. Oh yeah, oh, sorry, uh, there was one point I missed actually, because I just wanted to mention. Now notice when Jesus heals this man, when Jesus heals this man, he says, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. What does the man do? He arises, he wraps up his bed, and he carries it home by himself. So you notice here, this is, like a, this is a legitimate healing of somebody that was sick of the palsy, but now has the strength even to wrap up his own bed and carry it home and return to his house. So this is not your fake Benny Hinn type healing. Right? Where well, they get somebody in a wheelchair to stand up and go, oh, I don't feel any pain. And then they sit back down in their wheelchair and they're still in a wheelchair when they leave that building. Right? So that's why this is an actual real healing where that person no longer has the ailment that they supposedly have claimed to be healed from. So just be careful of fake healings out there. You know, like, I, like we had a testimony from um, the Garrett Kirchway, right? <laughs> he, he used to go to, because he used to be like this big Pentecostal, he went to the Benny Hinn. Uh, you know, crusades and whatnot and then he knew that he was first in line when he wanted to get up stage but when he got there there was already a line all in front of him because you know a lot of people think that they just like pay people to go up and go you know fall over and do all that stuff so this is a legitimate here like I was saying when we see the sick of the palsy here he rises takes up his bed and he walks it's a it's a it's a full healing here to and a removing of an ailment now, uh, let's go on. So here, oh, that's why I was going to go to Luke 5. Immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Mark 2. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. So I've just got two more quick points in this passage. Mark 2, where it says, Notice that when Jesus says, Arise, Take up thy bed and walk. Did it take some time before that person was healed? No. The Bible says immediately he arose. And what's the lesson there when it comes to salvation? When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, are you healed tomorrow? No. Spiritually? Are you healed when you die? No. No, immediately. That's why the Bible says, Verily, verily, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. You have it present tense you know this is why sometimes other like some christians get this mixed up well they think yeah you have it now in a sense but you're going to get it when you die so they believe you will have everlasting life and that's why they think well if you mess it up you don't live right you don't live right all the way to your death then you're not going to attain it when you die yeah you have i don't even know how they can say you have it now right but it's like you it's like you have the ability to have it now and you will get it when you die, but if you're faithful. But that's why eternal life doesn't work that way. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life. You have it immediately. Because at that very moment, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved from all your sins, past, present, and future. That's why you can't lose salvation. How can, if, you lose, if you can lose salvation, that means in that moment, not all your sins were forgiven. Because if there's a sin in the future that you did, that you will do, that wasn't forgiven and that's going to send you to hell. Because how, how can somebody, oh, maybe you can ask a question afterwards. How can somebody who has all their sins forgiven, past, present and future, what sin are they going to go to hell for? Right? So that's why they have eternal life. And you might have some questions there, but maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I can talk to you about it after if you have some questions. So here, he says here, immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. John 5 here. This is probably one great verse to show what happens past, present, 
and future in terms when it comes to your salvation. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. That's present tense. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So you see there the past, the present, and the future. What's present? You have everlasting life. Future, you shall not come into condemnation. Just like Jesus says in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Never means never. So that's why we can never come into condemnation. You shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's all our sins in the past as well, are past and are forgiven. So salvation happens in a moment. It immediately happens. And salvation is an event. It's not a process. That's why Jesus says you must be born again. You know, you're not born. You know, are you still being born? No, no, it happened that you were born on that day. You went from inside the womb to outside the womb, right? It was an event that happened, right? It's not a process. Salvation, and the last thing I want to say on this point is salvation happens now, not later. Because some people get this idea that you obtain salvation later, right? In terms of spiritual salvation. Now, I obviously understand that you get your body later, right? Which is the completion, completion of your salvation, right but you get the first fruits now you are sealed unto the day of redemption the moment you believe on jesus christ you've passed from death unto life now the last thing i want to mention here uh, we'll go the, to the last verse in mark 2 verse 12 and immediately he arose took up the bed and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified god saying we never saw it on this fashion. In Luke 5, look what they say here. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. So what I wanted to just mention here is, notice here, something obviously miraculous is happening here. They've seen things they haven't seen before, right? With these miracles. And how I wanted to draw a parallel with what I think about when it comes to salvation is the way of salvation in the Bible is a very unique story. And oftentimes when you share with people the story of salvation, people who have not understood it correctly, I don't know if you've ever had that, that, um, that encounter when you share the gospel with somebody, you explain it to them, say, hey, this is how salvation works. You believe on Jesus Christ, you're saved. You know, it's, it's that simple. It's that easy to be saved. Jesus did the hard work. They say, I've, I've, I've never heard it that way before. You know, I always thought I had to work my way to heaven. I always thought I had to go to church. I always thought it required a commitment on my behalf in order to be saved, you know, not to be obedient. And that's why I'm saying, like, the, the, the message of salvation in the Bible is so unique when you compare it to even other religions as well. So it's like here, it's oftentimes people say they've heard strange things today. They've heard of something unique because it is unique and if you think about most religions most religions that teach a works-based salvation what is it it's you trying to ascend to god you trying to make your way to god if you can get holy enough or sanctified enough to get to god hopefully you will be found worthy but what makes christianity different what makes the gospel different it's so unique it's the complete opposite it's the fact that we were not even trying to get to God. We were enemies of God, but yet God came down for us. Amen. What an amazing thing. So we'll end on this passage here in, um, uh, in uh, Romans 5. It says here, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. So what is it saying here? Christ died for those that are ungodly. And it's rare that even a good, you know, for a righteous man will one die. It's saying, hey, even if somebody was righteous, it's rare that somebody will die in their place. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died died for us. See, it's such a very unique 
story. It's a very unique message that the God of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ, came down for us. And a lot of people struggle with that. You know, a lot of Muslims struggle with that. They sort of think, well, God's so holy, how could he bring himself down to that level? And what they have to understand is a, lo a loving being with perfect love, how could he not come down to save us if he claimed to love us, which he did? Right? So it shows that his love was even greater than his, than his own glory to himself, right? Because he was willing to, 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 to temporarily take himself from that glory in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ and die for us on a cross. And what was the response of the people there? Immediately he rose up before them and took, on, took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, we have seen strange things today. So remember to praise and to give glory to God for your salvation, right? Remember to praise and give glory to God for other people that are saved as well. And when we praise God as well, we recognize the power that he has, that also should fill us with a healthy fear of God as well, right? So that, that, is, that is something that should happen in everybody's life you know, should happen. We should have this healthy fear. Not everyone does fear God, but we should also have this healthy fear of God that we want to obey God and we want to follow Him and use our life to serve Him. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that it was a blessing for the people here. And I pray as well, Lord, that you would help us to not be discouraged um, when things don't always go our way in our life, that you help us to be of good cheer. Help us, Lord, also to make sure we work at loving one another, loving our neighbors as well, because it's got to take work, Lord. So I pray for that, and I pray, Lord, you know, we're not perfect, but I pray that you'll help us to live a life in, in glory to you and in fear of you as you've called us to do. So help us, Lord, and pray that uh, the sermon here um, taught uh, people some things from your word today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.